share my screen and hope that everybody can see the screen. <sighs> okay, welcome. Really pleased to see you. Um, let's just check. Okay, lovely. So what we're doing is we're going to go through something which I've called your SEN toolkit, or your dyslexia toolkit. It comes from a project I'm working on called the SEN toolkit. The idea of the toolkit is really nice. Um, we're going to have three aspects to this toolkit. A gauge to help us measure the problem, a spirit level, as it were, to find the right balance for a, a, a nice learning environment, and a spanner to help us adjust our practices. Fairly simple, and as we go through it, you'll see kind of what I'm talking about. We begin with the gauge, where we're going to have a look at the scale of the problem, levels of awareness in schools, and a measure of how important this is. And it really is very important, as you'll come to see. So I'm going to run a poll. There's a question. How many people do you think? I know I'm starting to be interrupted from the start. You've got to forgive me. How many people do you think have dyslexia? Here are your choices, OK? In the world, how many people? What proportion? 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, or 25%? Cast your votes now. Let's see how, we, how many you think. Martin, just to say there's a couple of comments about the, the volume. If you could stand a tiny bit close to the microphone, okay. it'd be yeah. fantastic. Thanks. I'll stop walking backwards and forwards. <laughs> okay, how many people do you think? Okay, have we closed the poll? Do we have an answer? We think 15%, 20%. Anybody who said 5%, you're correct. Anybody who said 10%, you're correct. Anybody who said 15%, you're correct. Anybody who said 20%, you're correct. And anybody who said 25%, again, you're correct. How can I say this? Well, depending on which country you come from, different countries have completely different measurements of how many people have got dyslexia. So for instance, if you go to Nigeria, they measure the number of people as up to 33 and a third percent. If you go to Turkey, their official measurement is 0.05%. So there's different countries have completely different measurements for dyslexia, partly because they have different ideas of what dyslexia is, partly because of their orthography, partly because they use different tools for measurement. And sometimes they just guess. And so we don't actually know how many people, but the British Dyslexia Association and the International Dyslexia Association, two very well-known organizations and probably well-respected organizations, give the figure at about 15% of the population. The, um, the European Dyslexia Association has it at about 12% of the population. So what we know is that there are enough people in the world with dyslexia. This is shocking if you think about it. If it's 15% of the population, if it's 15% of the population, then 15% of the world population is the same as the combined totals of the entire populations of Brazil, the United States, Nigeria, Russia, Japan, and the United Kingdom put together. That's how many people have got dyslexia. I mean, it's, it's just, it's mind boggling when we put it in these kind of comparative figures. The combined total of Brazil, the United States, Nigeria, Russia, Japan, and the United Kingdom, if it's 15% of the world population. Of course, it's not only that we, we, we have different countries measuring dyslexia differently. This is one of the reasons it's so difficult to find out how many people have got dyslexia is, let's go to America. This is fascinating. If you go to America, Depending on what ethnicity you belong to, the chances of you being certified or assessed as dyslexic are completely different. So for instance, the number of white children in America who are at advanced reading level is 12%. The number of, of white children who are below basic reading level is 23%. But if you go over to the number of black or African-American children in America at advanced reading level, it's 3% and below basic, it's 52%. And so there's a huge significant ethnicity problem going on. So if you come from a black area or a, a, a First Nation area or even a Hispanic area, you are far more likely to be below average in reading than if you come from a white or an Asian area. Couple that with this, this is really shocking. 
If, for instance, you're Hispanic or Black or First Nation, the chances are, if you're in the lower percentiles of, of your subjects, you're only about, when you're less than 50% likely to be given special edu educational needs intervention. If you're white, you're three quarters likely, 74% likely to get special educational needs intervention. And so this ethnicity completely complicates uh, any, any notions of, that we might have of how many people have got dyslexia. We know that it's going to be around about 10 to 15%, but we can't say for certain because different countries have got different tools. Uh, ethnicity plays a part, orthography plays a part, culture plays a part. All of these things play a part, country, culture, ethnicity, and other, for instance, the kind of tools. And of course, another thing that plays a part in how many people have got dyslexia is simply the levels of awareness of what dyslexia is. So we're gonna move and have a very quick look at what we mean by levels of awareness. This is shocking. I'm going to give you some statistics. These come from two organizations, the British Dyslexia Association and an organization called Made by Dyslexia, which is co-funded by Richard Branson. According to statistics, this is shocking. Over 84% of teachers and parents say identification of dyslexic children is difficult or not possible in British schools. This is British schools. 91% of parents and teachers said schools needed better recognition of dyslexic strengths. We tend to focus on what they can't do. The very word dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, dysphasia, dysnomia, they begin with dys. We focus naturally on what people cannot do. 80% of parents said getting special educational access was difficult or impossible. And finally, 98% of parents and teachers said that teachers need more training in identifying dyslexia. These are the statistics, these are the facts, and these surveys were not small surveys. There were tens of thousands of teachers and parents uh, surveyed in this, and there's some statistics and some links at the end of the presentation if you want to check out some of the links. 60% of parents believe dyslexia support at school is poor or non-existent, and more than 40% of parents say their school doesn't even identify children with dyslexia. The chances are, if you're dyslexic, you're six times more likely to be excluded, and 61% of school exclusions are related to special educational needs such as dyslexia or ADHD. The scale of the problem is huge, and this is where it gets even more important. Let's just have a look at some of these statistics. 95% of parents worry about their dyslexic child's future and 76% of parents felt school did not do enough to support their dyslexic child. 72% of parents felt school did not nurture their dyslexic child's potential. In fact, if you look at the other side of this, uh, of this little infographic, you'll notice that around about a half of children avoid, if they're dyslexic, they avoid school and drop out of school. And by the way, I was one of them. I was one of these kids who, who avoided school. I was one of these kids who dropped out of school and went back in and dropped out, then went back in. Kept getting held, held behind by a year. No one knew I was dyslexic until I was 30. Shockingly, all of this adds up to these following kinds of social problems that we have. If you are dyslexic, you are twice as likely to end up homeless. You are 85% likely to attempt some form of self-harm. 50% of those in drug and alcohol rehabilitation units have got dyslexia. And finally, shockingly, you are 42% likely to attempt suicide. These are the figures about dyslexia. This is how difficult the problem is. So many people in the world are dyslexic. We don't know how to measure it because different countries and different organizations measure it differently. And yet the problems we're creating are enormous, but it's not all a problem. Not all a problem. Um, if anyone tells you Einstein said, you shouldn't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. He didn't say that. It's one of these other things that Einstein didn't say. However, it's true. If we can let that fish jump out of the tree into the waters, then the fish will swim, the fish will flourish. I guarantee it, okay? So how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we rescue 
as it were, a future generation of people with dyslexia from homelessness, from self-harm, from alcohol addiction, from, from attempted suicide. How do we rescue them from that? Well, very simply, we have to understand, first of all, what dyslexia is. We have to understand how it affects dyslexia in our context, not just how, how, how dyslexia affects people in general, but how it affects people in our context. And we've got to find out the types of learning that work and that don't work. Let's have a very quick look at some of these things. Those people who have a piece of paper near you, I didn't ask for this beforehand because I didn't know who was going to attend, but those people who are close to having a piece of paper and a pen, I'd like you to do something for me. I'd like you to draw a brain, okay? And I'd like you to draw a brain, like on the screen, the brain is made up of triangles, okay? So please just draw a brain made up of triangles. If you can do that, I'd be really grateful. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to do that. Go, thank you. This is a speed drawing contest. Okay, right, thank you very much. Now, if you've drawn your brain, I'd now like you to draw another brain. Okay, so I'd like you to draw a second brain. This time, do not create your brain out of triangles, create it out of squares, okay? So I'd like you to draw a brain a little bit like the one you can see on the screen, not out of triangles, out of squares. You've got 30 seconds, go. Okay, start thinking about drop finishing your brains, as it were. Okay, now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take each of these brains and do what I've done with my brain here. So as you can see, I've taken the brain and I've joined the corners of the triangles to the corners of the triangle. So I've joined up the corners of the triangles to each other. Can you do that with your triangle brain and do it with your square brain? So join the corners of the triangles to the corners of the triangles and the corners of the squares to corners of different squares in your brains. Thank you very much. I'll give you just about 15, 20 seconds to do that. Thank you. No one believed that when you were coming to a dyslexia awareness presentation, you were going to be drawing brains out of triangles. Okay, thank you. Now, all that I've done this for is that you can now realize that what we've done is we've effectively drawn a, a, a cubist version of a brain. Your brain is a physical thing. Um, the dyslexic brain develops physically different from the non-dyslexic brain. There's some fascinating research on the different development of the corpus callosum, that part of the brain that joins different, the two hemispheres. We believe, and in fact, there's a lot of research to suggest that in the dyslexic brain, the hemispheres are actually symmetrical, whereas in the non-dyslexic brain, they're not symmetrical. The dyslexic brain is slightly larger than the non-dyslexic brain. Um, what therefore this means is that what you've just drawn, uh, and I know it's a very, very simplistic account, but what you've just drawn is you have effectively drawn uh, neural pathways within the brain. The brain is a physical thing. You, uh, your neural pathways are themselves physical pathways within the brain. There's nothing magical about them. They are physical pathways within the brain, the ventral pathways, for instance. And you've just drawn um, neural pathways between two different brains that have been constructed differently. And you'll notice that the lines you've drawn go in different directions. And that's basically what's happening with the dyslexic brain. The neural pathways are slightly different. In other words, the dyslexic brain processes information slightly differently from the non-dyslexic brain. In other words, the dyslexic brain thinks differently from the non-dyslexic brain. So because of the way the neurology of the brain is created, the dyslexic brain thinks differently from the non-dyslexic brain. This has positives and negatives. Let's have a very quick look. First of all, we'll look at some of the negatives. 
Phonological decoding, working memory, executive function, and sequencing. These are four of the negatives that keep coming up and up and up. Phonological decoding is effectively, when you read a word, do you hear what it sounds like? Can you translate the word on a page into the sounds in your brain? That's effectively what phonological decoding is. In the EFL context, it's quite difficult because English is a difficult language. The classic example of how difficult English is, is a sentence such as, though she thought she caught the hiccups in Loughborough, she laughed when she realized she'd started to feel rough in Slough. This O-U-G-H sound, there isn't a sound for O-U-G-H, so the O-U-G-H uh, combination of letters has, I think it's eight different sounds in English, at least eight different sounds, depending on your accent. And this is what phonological decoding is. People with dyslexia generally, not all of, not everybody, but generally people with dyslexia suffer from phonological decoding problems. Working memory isn't just your memory, it's your ability to take short-term memory and apply it. That's what working memory is. So it's the ability to take short-term memory and apply it. So I often find that I can't copy things. I can't copy words because I look at a word and then I try to copy it and I can't remember how it's spelt. And this is one of the problems. So copying is a bad thing to get people with dyslexia to do because of the short term working memory issues. Executive function. I always describe executive function to people in terms of most people, especially most people who are not dyslexic, have what you would call a personal assistant living inside their heads. People with dyslexia don't. And this personal assistant can predict, can order, can sort out, can help you change from one task to another, can say, OK, this task is finished. Now let's do this task. Oh, something's just come up. Let's do this instead. That's what your personal assistant does. And people with executive functioning problems have trouble with this. We have trouble switching from task to task. We have trouble planning tasks. We have trouble prioritizing and ordering tasks. And this can sometimes translate into emotional problems with the planning and the ordering of tasks. So you'll find stress and people feel, feeling overwhelmed with tasks. And finally, sequencing, um, your left and your right. I can't tell my left from my right, genuinely. I know it, it, it sounds like a joke when I say this, but I can't tell my left from my right. And people have said, well, take your, your, one of your hands and it's an L, I don't know which one. <laughs> I often find, for instance, I've been in a pub and I've been st standing at the bar and I've seen the word Guinness behind the bar, the, the bar staff. And then I've realised that it's a mirror and the, the word's been written behind me and I've read it in mirror image and I haven't been able to tell. So this is what sequencing is. On the other side, we have creativity. So I'm going to ask you a question. This is a, this is a, a lovely little test of creativity. Which way is the bus going? Is it going left or right? So Paul, if you could share the poll, um, we've got three options. The bus is going left, the bus is going right, or you can't tell, okay? The bus is going left, the bus is going right, or you can't tell. Can you cast your votes now, please? Right, let's see whether we can see some of the results of this poll. Is the bus going left? Is it going right? Or can you not tell? 7% um, say it's going left. 15% say it's going right. And a whopping 79% say you can't tell. Well, interestingly, I love this. Oh, hang on, where am I? Um, if I can. Interestingly, this question was asked to preschool children in the USA. 90% of these children responded that the bus was going to the left. And when asked why, they said, because you can't see the door to get on it. <laughs> it's a very silly, little, uh, very silly little example. But actually, it's a test of creativity. There's a number of, of well-respected creativity tests, the Wechsler, the Wechsler test, the Torrance test for creative thinking. These tests use this kind of little, uh, little, little game, if you like. People with dyslexia, this is fascinating. People with dyslexia are always, always ranked 
among the most creative people you'll ever come across. Now, this isn't just being nice to people with dyslexia. I know you hear people going, oh, people with dyslexia, they're creative. It's not just to be nice to them. If you go to the website, go to my website, dyslexiabias.org, go to about dyslexia, and under the, the heading about dyslexia, there's a subheading, dyslexia and creativity. I cite nearly 20 independent academic studies demonstrating very, very clearly that those with dyslexia, on average, in general, come out significantly higher on creativity tests than those without dyslexia. And this is one of the things about dyslexia, this, this incredible amount of creativity. In terms of visual thinking, a couple of years ago, 2018, uh, an organization called Dyslexic Advantage surveyed 1,100 people. And they gave a statement. When I view 3D spatial images in my mind, I can manipulate them and see them from multiple angles. If you look on the left-hand side of this, the people with dyslexia in yellow, five and a half percent strongly disagreed, 10% disagreed, and it went all the way up to 30% agreed and 40, 42 and a half percent strongly agreed. In the non-dyslexic sample on the right, strongly disagree 23.6%, disagree 35, 36%, all the way down to strongly agree at 6.13%. They are Im mirror images of each other. They're inversions of each other. It seems, and this isn't the only study, by the way, there have been a, 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 a whole load of studies about this. It seems that people with dyslexia have got a really strong visual ability. The ability to visualize things and the ability to memorize things visually. We don't know why. We don't know whether it's because they're, they're making up for the fact that reading words, literacy, isn't, isn't very easy for them, or whether it's part of the way the brain's structured. But people with dyslexia tend to have extremely pronounced visual thinking skills. This allows people with dyslexia to reason holistically. And again, there's a lot of research on this. What we call global holistic reasoning, connecting the dots, realizing how things are connected, making connections between one thing and another, applying this to that. This is, this is global holistic reasoning, seeing the big picture. And again, there's an awful lot of research on this. And finally, sequencing. I put this as both good and bad. There's nothing wrong with maybe seeing sequences differently because I don't see things in a linear way. I see things as connected. And sequences, I give history tours to clients when, when I'm working in York. And it's not, never linear history. In 1066, this happened. In 10, 1076, this happened, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. History is this ball of, 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 of everything influencing everything else. I don't see sequences in the same way. I don't see time in the same way that most of my colleagues see time. So sequencing isn't necessarily a bad thing. If we use this idea of sequencing well, we notice that people who sequence differently can think differently and come up with ideas and answers that others can't come up with. But it all means in our context that the kinds of problems we're giving people because of the phonological processing, because of the working memory, because of the executive function, the kinds of problems we're giving those with dyslexia include orthography, now, for those of you who know what orthography is, I, I need to explain that very quickly for those who don't really uh, look at orthography. Um, orthography is um, a measure of how easy a language is to read. Is it a phonetic language? So we talk about orthographically transparent languages and orthographically opaque languages, or orthographically shallow and orthographically deep, depending on the language you want to use. An example of this is Finnish is probably Europe's most orthographically shallow or transparent language. Finnish Welsh, these two are very orthographically shallow. You read it, you know what it sounds like. English is Europe's most orthographically opaque language. You read something and you don't know what it sounds like. So the orthographies of different languages have a massive bearing. And whether you have a, a, a different language, if you come from a Finnish background and you're now trying to learn English, your first language is orthographically easy and English is orthographically diffi difficult. This is when dyslexia starts to become apparent. Spelling is a problem. Forgive them too much writing. Learning set rules. 
unconnected facts, giving people too many reading materials, writing and writing and writing. So these are the problems we're giving people. And they translate. They translate into social problems. People suffer socially. In terms of learning, they suffer with their self-confidence. They don't want to learn anymore. There's something called learned helplessness. There's, a, there's an old saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Well, the truth of the matter is, if at first you don't succeed, and if at second you don't succeed, and if at third you don't succeed, by the time you get to fourth, you'll stop trying. You'll believe you can't do it. Subconsciously, you will become unable to do it. Very simple example of how this might work is where's Wally? I don't know whether any of you have ever tried to do a where's Wally, but if you can't see Wally on the first go and you give up, and then someone gives you another where's Wally and you can't see Wally on the second go and you give up, by the time you get to the third, you're just going, oh, I can't do this. And we all know students whose response to certain learning is, I can't do this. This is called learned helplessness, this inability to learn because we have made them unable to learn. Not because they can't, but because we've taught them that they can't learn. The Matthew effect is effectively, intellectually and academically, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So if you read slowly, you will gain less knowledge per unit of learning than those people who read quickly. And the gap will widen exponentially, exponentially between the haves, academically, literacy, the haves and the have-nots. And this translates into their careers afterwards. A lot of the time what we're doing is we're preparing people for international careers or, 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 or something like that. We'll damage their careers if we don't take account of this. So how do we take account of this? Very simple. Make sure, and I'm sorry that the, the blue one at the bottom is not too clear. Make sure that your, connect, your learning is connected it's constructive, it's infographic, it's visual, and it's engaged. Take what we know about the creativity, the holistic thinking and the visual thinking. Take what we know about this. If you want to know how this works out in practice, a story I love telling. I was working a couple of years ago with a guy from Switzerland and he said that he'd been trying to learn English for 30 years and he couldn't do it. He said it made no sense. Teachers had told him stuff and, and he'd just forgotten it and he didn't know, obviously he wasn't as fluent as that when he said it. But he, he said he couldn't do English. And he said to me, he turned to me and said, Martin, what does English look like? I thought, what a fantastic thing to say. What does English look like? And I said, that's a very dyslexic type question to, um, to ask. And he said, oh, I'm dyslexic. And I thought, I thought you were. So we drew English. We drew the English language. This is it. This is English grammar. This is all you need to know about English grammar. Let me show you how, what it represents. There is the past, the present, and the future in different zones of this circle. And touching the past, the present, and the future, we have the simple, the present, and the continuous. Now we know what time zones, the past, the present, and the future. The past is behind us for our culture. The present is here, the future is over there. We know that the simple describes facts. The simple form describes facts. Uh, we know that the perfect tends to describe um, an unspecified past from a standpoint. So if it's the present perfect, I've eaten strawberries or I've been to Australia, an unspecified time in the past from, the, from, from our standpoint. And the continuous describes ongoing activities. We know this kind of, I mean, I'm being very general when I say that, but that's more or less what we know. We also know how to form the simple, the perfect and the continuous. I won't bore you with the simple, but the perfect obviously is um, subject, have, past participle. Uh, the continuous is the verb to be plus ing. So we know how to form them and we know what they do. If you take this triangle and rotate it in the circle, then suddenly the present perfect, I have been to Australia. Well, we know that it's talking about the past and we know how to form it. Subject, have, past participle, I have been to Australia. Turn it to the past, I had been to Australia. Turn it to the future, I will have been to Australia by a certain, a certain time. The present continuous, I am speaking, past continuous, I was speaking, future continuous, I 
will be speaking. We can turn into the, pre the perfect and the continuous of touching the present. I have been speaking. I have been eating. Let them touch the past. I had been speaking. I had been eating, etc., etc., etc. Now, this might not speak to you, but this dyslexic client of mine, he looked at this and he said, oh my God, I can see how English works. I can see how it fits together. What we've done is instead of take timelines, linear things that seem to be disconnected from each other, we just put English together and we've shown how the different parts of English work in combination with each other. We've taken this visual holistic way of looking at a language and that's what we've looked at. And the scales from, fell from his eyes. He could understand what we were talking about. In order to do this, we want to make our teaching easy. So we, we come up with checklists. We come up with checklists. A checklist is a very simple thing. Ask yourself, for instance, are my instructions simple? This is to reduce the stress on executive function. Do I break tasks into bite-sized chunks? Again, reduce the stress on executive function. Do I engage students in the process? We need their creativity. Text. Do I rely on text and on reading tasks? Can I reduce that? Do I ask students to copy? Because you can't copy if you're dyslexic. Well, generalization, but many dyslexic people find copying difficult because of working memory. And can I reduce my use of written exercises? Where you cannot reduce your use of written exercises, I'm just gonna give you a very simple tip tip on how to make the writing that you present simpler for those people with dyslexia. Here are two, para uh, two paragraphs on the left and two paragraphs on the right. They're exactly the same, okay? I copied and pasted. So you don't have to read both of them. I'll read them for you. This is an example of what written text often looks like in a typical worksheet, but actually it isn't because a typical worksheet has been printed and photocopied several times until it's dark and covered in smudges. The problem with this is that the text is often crowded and difficult to read for anyone. It isn't only dyslexic students who'll suffer if you continue to produce text in this fashion. It's all your students. Well, how do we make this slightly easier for people with dyslexia and indeed for almost everyone? There's an awful lot of work that goes into what a text, what text can look like for people with dyslexia. So what I'm doing, first things first, I'm changing the font on the right hand side, exactly the same paragraphs, but I've just changed the font. It's changed from a serif font to what we call a humanist font. I use Lila Wadi, which is my favorite font, but there are other humanist fonts available. Uh, humanist is a type of sans serif font, by the way. So what I've done is I've just changed the font. That's all I've done. Well, okay. Is there something else I can do? Yes. Here, instead of indented paragraphs, I've given them block paragraphs. So you're not reading one large chunk of work, you're reading smaller chunks of work. You're breaking it down into bite-sized chunks. Anything else you can do? Well, yes, this is very interesting. Exactly the same, but I've gone uh, onto font at the top of the page, clicked on options, gone into advanced, and increased the space between the letters by 0.1, or by one, by one point. I've increased the space between the letters. This has been shown through many, many studies to help people with dyslexia focus. Anything else I can do? Actually, there is. I've just softened the contrast between the background and the text. The background is the, the lightest gray you can imagine, and the text is a nice dark blue. And one final thing, I put a little box around it. Now, absolutely everybody, not everybody, I'm guessing 90% of the people who are watching this will be able to look at this and say, oh yeah, the right hand side is easier to read than the left hand side. Simple as that. Well, how do you choose a font? So I chose Lila Wadi. I spent a long time looking through fonts for the ones that I liked. How do you choose a font? Well, you want a font that, first of all, doesn't have serif. You don't like serif, the twiddly bits on the writing. But at the same time, certain fonts mirror each other. So some letters mirror other letters. 
You want to avoid that. But what do I mean by mirroring? Just a little video to show you. This is what I mean by mirroring. Okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit and explain what I mean when I say that uh, printed text, the letters in printed text might mirror other letters in printed text. So you'll notice that first of all, the left-hand column is red and the right-hand column is blue. They're not the same series of letters. The left-hand column, the red column, all has the same sequence of letters. Q, P, O, N, U, D, and B. But the right-hand column, the blue column, all has a slightly different uh, sequence of letters. Q, P, N, U, O, D, and B. And this will become apparent why quite soon. First of all, uh, I'd like to explain, uh, I've played around with the sizes of the letters so that I can get them more or less the same width, the same sort of, uh, the same size as each other. Uh, but they're, they're all different uh, fonts. So this first one here, you will see this first font is a classic serif font. It's called Georgia. You might find Times New Roman. And on the other side, again, it's Georgia, just in blue. Uh, so Georgia's the, the top row. The second row, uh, it's here on this uh, this pixel art program that I'm using. Uh, you can use any program you'd like. It's uh, it's something called Adolphine. Now I chose Adolphine because it's a very good example of what you might call a Gothic script. A Gothic script is where the strokes of the vertical parts of the letters just go straight up and down, and the 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 round parts are basically circles. So you can see that the Q is a circle with a, a vertical stroke next to it. Likewise, the P, a circle with a vertical stroke next to it. The N is two vertical strokes with a, a quarter circle archway attaching the two vertical strokes there. And the same on the other side, slightly different sequence of letters, slightly different color, but again, it's Adolphine, and you can see the Gothic nature of the letters here. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. Verdana, uh, it's a sans serif font, and it's a very common font that people are using sans serif, and on this side as well. So I don't think we need to explain more. If you've seen Verdana once, you've seen it a thousand times, I believe. Next, we have um, Gustavo. This is another sans serif font, slightly different from Verdana. So if you noticed here with Verdana, the strokes are all more or less the same size. With Gustavo, the D and the B, uh, appear slightly longer than the P and the Q. And the N and the U are slightly different. The N here has got far more of a vertical stroke and the U is a little bit more rounded there. And so there's a little bit of a difference there. We go down, this is a strange font, Ben Grass, um, but it's again, it's another sans serif font and it does something slightly different. There are curves here on the Q and the P the N is slightly curved, you can notice. The U is less curved. Um, the D there has a bit of a, a serif, not really a serif, but a bit of a curve there. But there isn't su such a thing like that on the B. And so you can see that each of the letters looks slightly different. And here, uh, this is called Peanut. It's not Comic Sans, that's not, uh, that doesn't appear on the Pixel Art program, but it might as well be Comic Sans. It's very, very similar. Okay, so why have I used QPONUDB on one side, but QPNUODB on the other? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the right hand column and I'm going to basically turn all of these series of letters upside down. So we'll just go here, we'll rotate this 180 degrees, and then we'll go down to the Dolphin one and we'll rotate it 100 and 80 degrees, and so on, and so on, and so on. There, and you can see that they've all been rotated 180 degrees, and it might become apparent now why they were all written slightly differently. Because what we can now do is we can now experiment. We can find what we call the mirrored letters. So let's go up to uh, Georgia, and we'll take the blue, version of the Georgia and we'll just bring it across here and place it on top of the red and you'll notice here at the bottom of the Q and the P and at the top of the D and the B and a little bit on the N and the U there are bits that don't quite match they don't mirror 
you can see that the uh, the Georgia doesn't invert and, and sit neatly on top of the on top of the, uh, the on top of its inverse, if you like. To show you what uh, what I mean and what does mirror neatly, this is the um, this is the Adolphine, the Gothic script, script that's been just turned upside down, and you'll notice when we take it across here that it is an exact match, and that sits perfectly. There's no uh, no overlap. There's no uh, there's no difference between, if you like, the the mirrored script in the red and the mirrored script in the blue. They are exactly the same as each other. Whereas this, you'll notice. Uh, the B's and the Q's and the P's, and even a little bit on the end, there's blue you can see sticking out and red, and they don't quite match. There we go. We'll go here. This is Verdana, very common font. I like it. It's a very nice font indeed. But again, you'll notice that pretty much the letters in Verdana mirror each other when you turn them around. So the D mirrors the B, the B mirrors the D, the P and the Q mirror each other. Um, the N and the U are just upside down versions of each other. And so we find that with things like Verdana, a lot of these sans serif scripts, they actually mirror each other quite, quite a bit. This sans serif script here, however, remember we chose it because the sizes of the vertical strokes on the P's and the D's, the B's and the Q's aren't the same and the N and the U isn't quite the same. So we see there, you can see the blue sticking up there, and it takes a while. There you go. And if you try to have the uh, the upward strokes of the of the red and the blue the same, then obviously there's a difference. So we try to place them as close as we can over each other. The U obviously has a difference. You can see the blue there, and the P's and the Q's, the D's and the B's upside down. They don't mirror each other. Very much the same in this in Ben Grass. Um, Slightly more pronounced, however, because you'll notice that the um, P's and the Q's, they have uh, more roundedness on them, and you can see more blue sticking through. And it's very difficult to, to place, if you like, to place one on top of the other and see that they're exact opposites of each other. Um, if you try to change it, yeah, it's very, you can't really do it. You can't really show, yeah. Very difficult indeed, very difficult indeed to get each of these letters to sit in, as it were, the same space on top of each other. This is um, this is a version of Comic Sans, and, and you can see clearly that there's a big difference between these letters. In, uh, and Comic Sans itself, the letter, the, the the difference is even greater. But it's it's you know it's impossible. To put, if you like, the inverted version of, of the blue on top of the original version of the red and have them form uh, the same shape and have them sit in the same space. And that's what we mean by mirroring. So we can see here that the serif font doesn't mirror. The Gothic font here, there's a lot of mirroring going on. Same with the sans serif font. These two sans serif fonts don't mirror. And of course, the, the comic sans type font. That doesn't mirror either, but you might have to be careful with, uh, with, with whether it's an appropriate font to use. And so you'll see, so you'll see, very simple techniques for how to make uh, reading easier. For those people with sequencing issues, if the fonts mirror each other, it can make, it can make reading a lot harder than it otherwise would be. So you want to avoid serif fonts, but you also want to avoid the fonts that mirror each other. I, as I say, I tend to, tend to choose something along the lines of Leela Wadi, because as you can see, the L's and the I's have got nice round parts on them and the, the, the T doesn't and the K doesn't, and humanist fonts as well. Um, a capital I is not as tall as the L. So if you write the word ill, then there'll be a difference in height between the letters. And that really helps people with dyslexia. So you, you've got to remember what you're looking for is you're looking to reduce the difficulties that people with dyslexia have, reduce the reliance on, for instance, phonological processing, reduce the reliance on executive function, reduce the reliance on um, uh, um, working memory. 
uh, and reduce the, the difficulties that we might present with sequencing, such as with letters. What you want to try to do is you want to attack those parts that people with dyslexia tend to be very good with. You want to attack, for instance, that you're teaching in terms of engaging people. You want to make it creative. You want to make it visual. You want to make it holistic. Uh, and these kinds of ideas make, make things like explore what, uh, what language looks like, become constructivist. So when you're teaching, um, when you're teaching prepositions, for instance, one, one constructivist way of teaching prepositions is to say, well, okay, let's take the preposition know, over, and then let's come up with as many songs, as many um, novels, as many movies, as many TV shows, as many sayings as we can that use the word over. Now, create categories. What, what do you think the, this, preposition is do, this preposition does? Get them to create their own categories. This is engaging and it's creative, rather than just say, this is what they do. Because that's not gonna get anybody. That's just relying on working memory. Whereas you want to rely on creativity. And that's the kind of thing that you want to do when you're looking at teaching. And we're running out of time. So I'm just gonna say, now you've got your toolkit. All you have to do, is get to work. Thank you very much indeed. And I hope it's been at least useful in some parts of what we've mentioned. Thank you. I think I, shall I stop sharing, Paul? Uh, yeah, you might as well, Martin, that's probably fine. That's great, thank you. Where are we? Well, we'll, we'll leave it up, it doesn't, doesn't actually matter, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, thank you, Martin, very, useful I think for a lot of people certainly from the, from the comments very useful um, and very engaging very interesting um, <laughs> ever so much for that yeah no brilliant um, there are quite a few questions we don't have a lot of time so I'm gonna kind of I'm sort of trying to group them um, one okay so this is an interesting one partly because I've learned a completely new word for me um, thank you David Coulson um, com comorbidity ah, right okay um, Come on, uh, yes. So I know. Uh, yes, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, just, just for people watching, in case they don't know, uh, refers to the medical condition of two disorders or diseases coexisting at once. I'm sure you knew that, Martin. Obviously, um, for sure. so for instance, I, I have dyslexia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, and ADHD. These are okay. comorbidities. Right. Okay. Well, that, that that's the question. Is there is there yeah any comorbidity between dyslexia and other other conditions? such as ADHD, is that a common thing? It's very common. In fact, it's more common to be comorbid than not comorbid. If you've got dyslexia, you've got a 45% chance of having ADHD. If you've got ADHD, you've got a 25% chance of having dyslexia. Even dyslexia and autism. Um, this is really interesting because different parts of the brain affect whether you're dyslexic or whether you're autistic. Uh, and so one of the parts is the, the outer column, we call it the mini columns on the outer column of the brain. Dyslexic mini columns, uh, these are like stacks of neurons, are really tall and quite far apart. Um, autistic mini columns are really short and really bunched together. And what that means is people with autism process lots of information really quickly and have a localized view of things. People with dyslexia process slightly slower, but they have a more globalized view of things, which explains the global holistic thinking. But that's not all of what dyslexia and autism is. And so there are different parts of the brain that when, they, when they're affected in particular ways, the corpus callosum, for instance, can give both dyslexia and autism at the same time. So there's a lot of comorbidity. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, David, hopefully that's answered your question. Uh, I'm going to sort of bundle a few questions together, uh, 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 kind of around diagnosing dyslexia. Um, so there's, 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 there's a couple. Um, first one is around um, uh, how, how do you um, diagnose dyslexia? And sort of coupled with that is uh, around the teacher's role. Are, are teachers um, supposed to diagnose dyslexia? And this is from, sorry, from Daniel. Um, he says that when he went through his teacher training um, in, in the US, he learned that, that, um, that teachers aren't supposed to diagnose dyslexia. So, so well, yeah, I suppose there's yeah, questions, so, questions in there. First of all, it depends which country you, you live in. So, for instance, in France, dyslexia is a medical condition. I think it's five nations in the European Union, dyslexia is a medical condition. 
Uh, and even in places like Germany, where dyslexia isn't a medical condition, in Bavaria, it is a medical condition. So different states of different countries. Um, mm -hmm. If it's a medical condition, it's diagnosed by a doctor. If it's not a medical condition, it's assessed by an educational psychologist or a psychologist. So I was assessed by a psychologist and then my second assessment was an educational psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, what people are looking for in general um, and, and how, how is it assessed depends on who, who's looking for it. So I, I mentioned at the beginning, or Paul mentioned at the beginning, I'm, I'm running a project or driving a project I'm running it because <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> I'm driving a project to try to find an internationally acceptable translation tool between different measurements. Some countries will measure it purely on phonological processing speed. Some cultures will measure it on reading speed and they're different. Some countries will measure it on phonological processing speed compared with different cognitive faculties. So are you average or above average on different cognitive faculties? Some countries will take the, um, the, the standard deviation and it will be different. So for instance, if for instance, reading speed is supposed to be 100 words per minute and one country has a standard deviation of five and you read at 95 words per minute, they might, or 94 words per minute, they might classify you as dyslexic. If another country has a standard deviation of 10 and you're reading at 94 words per minute, they won't classify you as dyslexic. So it depends where you're looking at. What teachers want to look at, and this is the key, this is the one thing I always tell teachers, look for the difference between what you would call obviously intelligent and the grades that they're getting. That's what you want to look at. Are they intelligent, but are they producing the work that you want them to produce? As soon as there's a difference, that's the place where you start to look for dyslexia. Okay, okay. Um, okay, uh, so I'm just... Uh, da, da, da. Uh, some Krish Gandhi uh, is a primary teacher. With um, he's, The question is, with children who are dyslexic, what's the best way to differentiate for them? I think it's for, yeah, particularly for, for primary school children. Yeah, well, primary school children. Um, uh, so I didn't catch the name. Was it, Krish, was it Krishna? Krish. Uh, Krish. Krish. Gandhi, yeah. Krish. Okay, so it depends what you mean. So if you say differentiation, uh, there are all sorts of kinds of differentiations that we use as teachers. Differentiation by time, by pace, by uh, accommodations, by outcome, all sorts of things. One of the things we can do is we can just say, well, I think one of the key things is to say, we have a task. What are we doing with this task? Are we making people um, work through the book or are we trying to get them to hit a particular target or are we trying to get them to actualize a cognitive faculty? And this is what we want to think about with differentiation. So often, um, if you have to work through a book, that doesn't differentiate for dyslexic people at all in general. So what you want to do is ask, well, what is it we're trying to do with this lesson? Mm -hmm. um, for instance, if you want me to analyze Charles Dickens' Hard Times, do I have to read it or can I go to the theatre? Uh, and, and so often uh, in, in schools, we're asking kids to read these things, but just like watch a movie. Why not? We don't have to put pressure on the cognitive faculties if we want them to analyse something. Yeah. And similarly with exams, um, this is a pet love of mine talking about exams. If we're going to examine kids by, or, or even adults, uh, at the end of a course, Often what the exam is doing is the exam is testing them on working memory and it's testing them on executive function. Can they remember things and can they order things and prioritize things? It's not usually testing them on the kind of learning that we've wanted to give them, especially if these exams are multiple choice, which usually tests them on phonological processing. So for instance, um, I've got a bad knee. What's the, uh, what's the liquid inside my bad knee? Is it synovial fluid? Is it synaptic fluid? Is it synoptic fluid? Well, this isn't testing me on whether I know about the knee. This is just trying to catch me out with phonological processing difficulties. So the way that we test kids, the way we examine them, often oral testing is better than written testing to begin with. And, and testing through production, project work, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I think that sort of answered a few questions actually, which is quite good. Um, I've never heard of this, maybe you have. This is a question from Leah, Leah, Leah Booker. Um, what do you think of stealth dyslexia? Have you heard of stealth dyslexia? This might be something I haven't, actually, no, I haven't heard that term. Um, uh, could you explain what that means? Is it Booker? Could you explain what that means? Yeah, it, may have yeah. a different, it may have a different label in, in other 
context. Okay. I wonder whether it's it's sort of related to people who have it but aren't diagnosed. There's a few questions around, you know, if, 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 yeah, as, as an adult. It could yeah, also, to... yeah, it could also relate to something that they call um, surface dyslexia. Um, okay. And uh, I have surface dyslexia. Surface dyslexia is not quite the same as phonological dyslexia. So I can spell really well, but I couldn't before I was 16. I had no idea of how to spell. And then I taught myself etymology and morphology. So I taught myself rules. And once I knew the rules, I could spell. And this is it. So people with surface dyslexia, it's, their, their issue isn't phonological processing. Their issue is understanding why something happens. And it's why I can spell really interesting words, but I can't spell people's names because I don't understand the rules. And I keep spelling my mum's name wrong. I keep spelling, uh, I've got a friend called Derek and my brother's called Philip. I spell their names wrong me all the time because I don't get the rules for how it's spelled like that. So right. this is what they call surface dyslexia. If you mean that, um, it's a different kettle of fish, as we say. <laughs> Okay, okay, interesting. Um, this one, maybe just one more then. Uh, this is sort of more for you, this is from an anonymous attendee, so sorry, I don't know who you are. Um, the question is, how are you getting on with your PhD, given that you're dyslexic? Ah. And that they're saying that they'd like to do a PhD, but they're not certain they could. Um, okay, right. So if you do a PhD, um, especially for, for people with dyslexia, you need to, to create, my supervisor and I created tram lines for myself to keep myself on the right track, because it's very easy for someone with dyslexia to go off, tr off track, very, very easy indeed. And so we worked really hard on creating these tram lines and, and I do a little bit of work and we check it. I do a little bit of work and we check it. I do a little bit of work and we check it. Emotionally, psychologically, a PhD is incredibly hard. I mean, I, I have no idea how hard it would be emotionally, but it's mm. so worth it. My problem is my supervisor died just over a year ago. Uh, they haven't found me a supervisor really to stand in for, for that. And, and I wanted to, to leave York uh, and, and hold myself up in a, in, a, in a building away from all the distractions to write up because I'm, I'm close to the end now. But with the pandemic, that's proving difficult. So mm -hmm. I had to find ways around it. But Still thanks for asking. I really appreciate that. Okay. Um, and just very, very quickly, the font that you like to use, what was it some people have asked? Um, Lilo Wadi. Let me just put this into the chat. Um, so what I ask people to do usually, how do I chat? What I ask people to do is play around with different fonts. Um, I played around and found Lilo Wadi. Okay. Um, really, really useful. Uh, and it's a humanist font. Not a gothic font. So avoid serif, avoid gothic, go for humanist fonts. Uh, and you can just find on Google different examples of humanist, gothic, and, and, and serif. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's pretty much everything we've got time for. Just um, just very quickly, and just to say thanks ever so much again, Martin, for that. It was really informative. And Thank you. I, I, really hope it, I really hope it spoke to people. I really do. Please contact me if you need any information. So, yeah, you've got, I think, yeah, you've had the, the email address. So we will be making, so just, yeah, so to deal with some of the questions, uh, handouts available, we will be putting the, um, the presentation available as a PDF um, on the site on teaching English, uh, which is where the recording will also be. So you'll be able to see that. Um, what else? Certificates, just to sort of let you know, I have put the link in a few times. Um, you will be getting an email um, tomorrow, which will have a link to the certificate and also to the feedback survey. I'm just going to put another link in uh, to the feedback survey. Please do fill that in. Um, and if you fill that in, when you get to the end, there's a link to the certificate there. So there's a little carrot um, for you as well. So thank you ever so much. And I I think it's pretty much it. Next week we have another webinar. We have David Heathfield, who's going to be talking about um, storytelling in online um, context. So, uh, so please do join us next week for that. I'm going to leave you um, with a, another a final thank you to Martin um, and uh, and also to York Associates, obviously for <laughs> wait, 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 who you work with for, for, for providing the um, the space. Uh, fascinating, fantastic, and. Thank you. Thank you and thanks everyone for joining us and hopefully we'll see you uh, see you again soon. Okay, I'll leave you to it. Thank you. Cheers, Martin. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your feedback and uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining. Okay, take care. Bye. See you all next week, hopefully.